Hello, women in technology and friends. I'm Sam. I'm a developer at Adyen for the last four years, and I'd love to tell you a bit about developers. Over the past seven years, I've worked in a variety of different teams. I've worked as the only in-house person in a team full of consultants. I've worked on a BI or business intelligence team. I've worked uh, as a part of a team with marketing and brand designers. And most recently, I'm working on a product team. One thing I can tell you about all of these teams is that although they're very varied, there are some common threads. And from this experience, I hope to bring you today some actionable tips on how to work better with developers. I always find that the best way to create a good interaction with a colleague is to first and foremost understand that person. You need to understand them and what makes them tick. I'm not saying that you need to be able to read their minds, but if you understand the basic principles that they operate on, then you have the ability to make a, a bit of a guess at how they might react to a certain situation or a problem or an idea. You want to understand things from a developer's point of view. This means that first you need to understand a couple of core principles of code. Don't close the webinar just yet. I promise to keep it to the minimum required, but it is important that we go over it, and here's why. If a person wants to understand things from the point of view of an economist, they're going to be doing themselves a huge service by first understanding some core principles of modern economics. So this person would start by understanding that supply and demand have an inverse relationship and where those two lines cross is the price point at which the market is at equilibrium. After someone appreciates this, they're then ready to talk at least at some level about how, hypothetically speaking, a cargo ship blocking a vital trade route, let's say the Suez Canal, might impact the global economy. If we change the industry to software engineering, then it follows that someone looking to put themselves in the shoes of a developer or in the fancy gaming chair of a developer, then they're going to need to understand some core principles of code. So I'm going to explain some core principles of code to you now. So code is, at its core, a set of instructions that a computer will follow. Depending on different circumstances, though, you want to give the computer different instructions. So that's why when we're developing, we have to create different pathways through the code. So different situations get different instructions. We can create different paths in our code using conditionals. The computer chooses a pathway based on whether or not an equation is true. If the condition is true, then pathway number one, or the if block, will be the instructions that the computer follows. If it's not true, then we follow the instructions in our separate else block. Let's take a look at this example. We tell the computer that x is 10. Then, when the computer reaches our conditional check, asking us if x is 10, the computer will follow pathway number one. If we run the same program, but change x to 11, then the instructions in pathway number two are followed. Like I said, programs are all about giving the computer instructions to follow. Programs also usually take data and do something with it. So when we talk about data, we have a couple of different simple types. For example, uh, numbers or lines of text. We call them strings because it's a string of characters all lined up together. These are examples of primitive type types. We also take these primitive types and make them into groups or data structures. One example I can give you is a list. So a list, or in developer speak, an array, is a bunch of pieces of these primitive data in an order. For example, here you can see a list of strings, hello and women in tech, and a list of numbers. 42, 121, 144, 9001. With arrays, each position has a number, and we call that the index. Usually, but not always, the first position is actually position zero. So at position zero of each of these arrays, we have hello and 42. At position one of each array, we have women in tech and 121. Now, Let's say we have a program that displays the value in position three of a provided array. The program will simply print the value at position three. If we supply our array of numbers, then the program will display the number 9001. Over 9000, wow. Now, what happens when we run our program on the array of strings? We run into a problem. This is an edge case. 
We need to tell the computer what to do no matter what happens. We need to expect the unexpected and give instructions for the computer to follow in all cases. This is something that developers do a lot of the time and why sometimes they'll come to you with very strange questions like what happens if this, what happens if that. They're trying to find the edge cases. So we add a conditional. First we check, is it true that the array has at least four items? If it's true, then we follow the first code path and print the array position three. If it's not true that the array has four items in it, then we need to print out a message that says array does not have a position three. And that's how we handle edge cases. It takes thousands and thousands of these code pathways to make a working program or a product. That's why my first actionable tip for you is to ask your developers for a diagram. A diagram will help you to more easily understand what the context is of the code. And you know, if a picture is worth a thousand words, a diagram is at least double that. There are conventions for different types of diagrams to answer different types of questions that you might have about the way a program works. So asking for a diagram isn't something controversial to ask of your developer. Once you have these diagrams, they're a great resource for quickly onboarding and ramping up new team members, both developers and uh, other roles alike. To explain the personality of a developer, there's not any one exact shape that you can apply. Developers come in all types of personalities with all sorts of interests. One of the things that's kind of funny, and I've found evidence of this mentioned in an article by Paul Ford called What is Code, is that developers have an interesting sense of humor. So he says, developers are funny like your uncle. They make jokes that make you laugh and sigh at the same time, or just sigh. For a little bit more uh, research on this, I can recommend a web comic called XKCD and uh, make sure that you hover over the image and you'll get a little bit more text that sometimes gives a bit of an explanation. But it's just something that you get to know as you get to know the developers as people as well. When a developer is writing a program, in their head, they're building a house of cards. It's very fragile and there are a lot of layers to it and it takes a lot to keep it all stable. That's why when we're developing, we have best practices and some core principles that we like to follow. One of these is called don't repeat yourself or dry. With this principle, we try to use the same pathways over and over instead of writing the code again. So if you hear a developer talking about don't repeat yourself or dry, that's why. Hopefully that gave you a bit of a peek into the mind of a developer. Now let's talk a little bit about the stack. You've probably heard this term thrown around quite a bit, but what does it really mean? Well, it depends. The stack can vary based on if a developer is working on a app for Android, an app for iOS, a desktop application, a web application, some sort of product that's on a website. Then that's not even mentioning embedded applications. So your smart fridge or your microwave. I'm going to make an assumption that most of the companies here, the main product or service is a web app. For that reason, I wanna take you through the typical modern web development stack. There's nothing quite like software. So I wanna give you a couple of nice analogies to use to paint a picture of the stack in your mind. But I will start out with just a quick explanation of the stack itself. In a web application or a website, you have the front end. That is the layer that is everything visual and everything you interact with, things that move, the way it looks, that's all front end. The front end layer makes calls to a layer lower, the server. The server is where the data lives. And when you visit the website, the server gets asked for the front end files and sends them to your browser so that you can see it. And then there's another process where the front end requests back to the server for the data. It lets the front end know, for example, what items are for sale and how much they each cost. Now the server knows this because it goes one level lower to the database. 
And the database is like a very strict Excel sheet. The database is where the source of truth of all of the information lives. These are usually the three layers that you think of with web development, the front end, the server, and the database. So I promised you some imperfect analogies. Let's start with a stack of pancakes, fluffy American pancakes. You have three of these delicious pancakes stacked on top of each other on top of a lovely ornate plate. In this version or visualization, the top pancake is your front end. It's what you see when you look at the plate. Then the pancake below that is the server. One level lower, we have the database layer of the stack, the bottom pancake. The plate also plays a role in this analogy because these stacks don't just exist in thin air. They have to be supported by something. So that's your infrastructure or the machinery that, that the software is held on. Additionally, you have some toppings that you put on the, on the stack of pancakes. And you can think of this as the users putting their data into the application. This analogy works in a number of ways that I just mentioned, but where it fails is that nothing's really moving through the stack. Uh, everything's quite static. So in reality, you have data flowing between these layers. It would be a more accurate analogy if the bottom pancake was pushing chocolate chips up through the middle pancake to the top and then back again. But we all know that's not how pancakes work. Let's try another imperfect analogy, a car. With the car, everything that you see is the front end and the engine is the back end. All websites have a lot of similar pieces to them. They're made of the same parts. And this is reflected in this analogy where every car has doors, has a windshield, has mirrors, headlights, and the front end changes how these things look from car to car, but they are predictable parts. Where it fails is that, first of all, the database is left out of this one. And secondly, the things are not in the right place. You have the front end surrounding the back end, and that's, you know, it's more of layers. So another imperfect analogy. My next and final imperfect analogy is a relay race. In a relay race, each team member passes a baton to the next and, and the running continues. Each team member here represents a new part of the stack. The baton represents the data that's flowing all the way from the first team member, the database, to the next, the server, and onto the front end who crosses the finish line with the baton. This analogy works better than the others because there's actually some, something moving through the layers. But where it fails is that the data can go both ways. So if you wanna make this analogy work a little bit better, then the race goes on and on and they run back and forth, handing the baton each way for the data to go to the user and then to be saved back to the database. Oh, look, we have a meeting. That's great because I wanted to share a few tips about meetings with developers. The first and biggest tip I can give you is to bring developers problems. Don't have a meeting and tell them what to build and expect everything to be hunky-dory. You want to bring them a problem. Maybe you have an idea on how to solve it, but they have so much more context with how things are already built, what's already been done, that you're going to find the best solution if you think with them on how to solve it. That being said, you also want to involve developers early in a project. So if you're in a meeting and you're talking about needing to build something and there's not a developer in the room, you should probably call one in. They can give you a lot of perspective on the ideas that you're having at an early stage and facilitate things going smoothly later on. Another note on meetings is that it's natural that sometimes people disagree. When you find yourself butting heads with the developer, sometimes the thing that people try to do is to just keep going higher and, and sort of explain <laughs> why their idea is better. I want to sort of give you the tip to instead dig deeper and figure out where your facts don't align. There's usually something underlying that disagreement, which is a new piece of information for one of the parties. 
So find that first instead of butting heads. You don't have to just take my word for it. I have a really nice link to a podcast. It's 20 minutes and it's a conversation between some product managers and developers about how to work well together. I would like to introduce you to a lesser known tool in the world of software development. That is the rubber duck. When we're working on figuring out where a piece of logic goes wrong or finding a very obscure bug in our code, we often say to talk out loud to a rubber duck in very simple terms, and that will help you find the bug. You can also offer to be a rubber duck for someone as a way to say, explain your code to me and we'll find the bug together. So if you see a stuck and frustrated developer, maybe you can cheer them up by offering to be a rubber duck. I'd like to reiterate some of the actionable tips that we talked about today. Ask for diagrams, think about edge cases, offer to be a rubber duck, and check out some XKCD developer comics every once in a while. Ask why they're funny. You'll get some nice information. Finally, and most importantly, get to know your colleagues as people. Developers are not robots. They do have emotions. They have interests. And they're, well, in my opinion, great people. So get to know them first as people and work with them as your trusty neighborhood developer and enjoy. I hope that today you were able to learn something new about the way that developers think, the stack that we work with, and how to make your meetings go a bit easier. I'll be available for a few minutes afterwards to answer any questions you might have about the presentation. If you want to know more about Adyen, then check out our virtual booth. Thank you so much for joining us today, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.